absolutely wonderful to be back in the church. February was a challenging month for everybody, but we did manage to survive. So the only announcement that I have, uh, we will have Sunday school next Sunday, um, and we will have a session meeting immediately following uh, services. So it's good to be back. Yay! I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm glad to be back too, and I'm glad everybody's on, on the recovery side of COVID. I'm sorry that went through your families. Uh, I know that's been hard. Our call to worship is printed in your bulletin. There's so much we do not understand, so, so many, many mysteries in this, this life of faith. faith. <clears throat> we know some things are certain. We, we know that our help comes, comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. earth. God is our keeper and the shade at our feet. our eyes to the Lord. Our hymn is number 56 in the green hymnal. To God be the glory.
that we may be born again through your Spirit. Help us to believe and give us the abundant life that comes from following you. And our declaration of pardon is this. We know that if we confess our sins, God is always ready and more just to forgive us our sins. In the name of the Father, we are forgiven. Amen. Well, we're at the second Sunday of Lent. Um, and so we're extinguishing the second candle leading up to uh, those six Sundays between Ash Wednesday and Easter. And so we extinguish the second candle in our journey towards Easter. Our scripture this morning is from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. And if you're using the Good News Bible, which I'm using, I think that's the one most commonly found in the pew. It's in the second portion of the Bible known as the New Testament. And I'm reading from the Good News Bible. Let us pray. Father, we come opening your word that it might speak to us anew on this day. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our minds and our hearts to receive a word from you. For it's in the name of Christ we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> John chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. There was a Jewish leader named Nicodemus who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. One night he went to see Jesus and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher sent by God. No one could perform the miracles you are doing unless God were with him. Jesus answered, I'm telling you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a grown man be born again, Nicodemus asked. He certainly cannot enter his mother's womb and be born a second time. I'm telling you the truth, replied Jesus, <coughs> that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of the water and the spirit. A person born physically of human parents, but he, he is born spiritually of the spirit. Do not be surprised because I tell you that you must all be born again. The wind blows wherever it wishes. You hear the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. It is like that with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can this be? asked Nicodemus. Jesus answered, You are a great teacher in Israel, and you do not know this? I'm telling you the truth. We speak of what we know and report of what we have seen, yet none of you is willing to accept our message. You do not believe me when I tell you about the things of the world. How will you ever believe then when I tell you about the things of heaven? And no one has ever gone up to heaven except the Son of Man who came down from heaven. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert. In the same way, the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world, so that for God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. 
May the Lord add rich blessing to the reading of the word. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> well, born again. That's a interesting phrase in the Christian language, isn't it? Uh, and and, and it's, uh, it's one of those things that we get wrong so much so. We think, oh, I'm a born-again Christian. And while that is true of all of us, it's not something that we attain to. And that's one of the mistakes we made. Some years ago, I was watching a baseball game, and a guy was holding up a big sign, John 3.16. And the announcer said, that's the batter, John so-and-so, and that's his batting average. And I thought, mm, don't think that's what the guy was talking about. Uh, else, why did he have the colon, the colon after it, after the three? And, and uh, even though the batter was named John, that would be a pretty good batting average. I don't know about you, but the batting averages are made uh, or figured if you bat a thousand, that means you hit a home run every time. Every time you get up to bat, you hit a home run. Nobody's ever done that. As a matter of fact, one of the greatest hit hitters of all time was, um, let me get this right. Uh, Mickey Mantle. You remember Mickey Mantle? Some of you might can remember watching Mickey Mantle. Mickey Mantle got up to bat a number of times. 1,710 of those times he struck out. His batting average was just over 300 for his lifetime, which was a fantastic batting average. But you know, Mickey Mantle didn't have the most number of strikeouts in his career. No, that honor was held at the time that Mickey Mantle got his 1,710 strikeouts by a guy named Babe Ruth. Now, granted, Babe Ruth hit more home runs than anybody, and for years that record stood. But he also had the record for the most strikeouts. Amazing, isn't it? Even his batting average didn't exceed half. Never in any of his seasons did he ever hit 500. As a matter of fact, nobody's ever hit 500. 50-50. Nobody's ever hit that. And that, that record stood until Reggie Jackson broke it <laughs> for the number of strikeouts. It's amazing because we imagine great ball players as never fading. It's baseball season, y'all. Can you tell? I, and I love baseball season. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. And I and I have a, a couple of teams I follow. <clears throat> some of you may follow the Braves. I don't, but uh, some of you may. Uh, <clears throat> I follow mostly college teams, and the college team I follow the most are the Pirates, over in eastern part of the state at East Carolina University. And I follow them because for 15 years, some of those boys would come to my church <laughs> and I got to know some of them. And uh, I got to know some of the coaches and uh, it, it's just fun to follow a team where you've known some people who played on the team. As a matter of fact, their present coach played under Keith McClair. Uh, and then he was an assistant at Mississippi State and became the head coach some years ago at East Carolina. Uh, and it's interesting that East Carolina is ranked number nine in the nation this year, or was until yesterday. Uh, I don't know what they're ranked today or will be ranked after this weekend though. But they're playing in what's called the Keith LeClaire Classic. It's a, it's a weekend where they invite three other teams to come in and they do kind of a round robin. Tonight they play George Washington, a 
Oklahoma, uh, in Washington, D.C. Yesterday, the team that beat them was uh, uh, Long Beach State University from California, from Long Beach, California. And uh, it's interesting that those teams came in because they wanted to be in that tournament, made the trip to be there. Even George Washington, which I wouldn't have thought would have accepted the invitation after the first three games of the season, East Carolina beat them all three times. So I've got my fingers crossed that they'll beat them again. Although they beat that school in Chapel Hill twice last week and then let the school in Durham beat them. So, you know, baseball is an uncertain thing. One of my favorite stories about baseball is, is about a, a guy named uh, Bob Brindley. Bob Brindley played for the San Francisco Giants most of his career. He, uh, he then was a general manager for uh, a couple of baseball teams. Uh, and now he's a commentator. He has one of the greatest stories about baseball I've ever heard. In 1986, Bob was playing baseball for the San Francisco Giants against the Atlanta Braves. And he still holds this record. I couldn't find anybody who's ever broken this record. But at that time, he broke the record, and I don't think it's been broken since then. In the Fourth inning, Bob was playing third base, and the ball came to him, and he dropped it. The guy was safe. The guy ended up getting a run, because in that same inning, the ball was hit to him again. He dropped it again, and as he dropped it, he kicked it with his foot, and he had to chase after it, and when he threw it, he threw it over the first baseman's head. <laughs> So in one play, he made two errors. He'd already made one, that was three errors. That matched the most errors ever committed by a single player in an inning. Three batters later, he muffs the ball again. His fourth error in the same inning, in the fourth inning of that game, I couldn't find any record that anybody's ever broken that. Four times. And <clears throat> those four errors allowed four runs to cross the base. In the fifth inning, he hit a home run and drove two people in. In the seventh inning, he got on base, hit an infield ball, got on base and ended up getting it across home plate because other people drove him around. And then in the bottom of the ninth, this is hard to believe, in the bottom of the ninth, Bob hit the game-winning walk-off home run. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Now suppose Bob, at the end of the fourth inning, had just walked into the dugout through the tunnel and kept going and said, I'm done. I'm done with baseball. I am terrible at this game. He would have never had the opportunity for that redemption in that game. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> if you look at the scorecard at the end of the game, Bob's scorecard read four errors four runs allowed, two home runs, four runs batted in, and the game-winning home run. So see, it kind of balanced out. <laughs> All of that terrible fourth inning kind of balanced out. You know, <clears throat> we live our lives as those who make errors. We, we just do. Sometimes we just muff it. Or we kick it so hard down the road that we never can catch up to it. You know, 
We make so many mistakes in life, and it's so easy to do. And yet, we have our moments. We have our moments when we're allowed to redeem ourselves, to get things right for a change. When Jesus talks in these scriptures to Nicodemus, He's not talking about being born again of a woman or even getting saved. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about redemption. Our lives being redeemed, being put back right. And it's put back right not by something we do, but what Jesus did, the coming of the Son, the sacrifice that Jesus made. I mean, it talks about it right here. The Son of Man has to be held up like the serpent in the wilderness so our eyes focus upward and not downward. Or, as the Revised Standard Version says, you're thinking wrong, Nicodemus. You're talking about being born of the earth being born into this life. I'm talking about being born from above. Being born of God. And that's who we are as God's faithful people. We're the ones who are born again. Born again not by some conjuring of our own wills or some doing of our own purpose, but born again as God's redeemed people through Jesus Christ. That's who we are. We're the ones who know of our redemption. We know that God has not given up on us. Or as, uh, let me get his name right. Here somewhere. Sorry, y'all. Names fly out of my head sometimes. Yogi Berra. You know, ever heard that name? Yogi Berra said, It ain't over till it's over. He said some other things too, but that's one of the things he said. Don't look back, it might be kitchen. But it ain't over till it's over. Now, Bob Brindley knows that. The game's not over till it's over. There's always a chance of our redemption. Life is not over till it's over. There's always the opportunity that God isn't finished with us yet. I mean, after all, when Jesus came to earth in our form, remember the people he associated with. They weren't the successful people, the rich people. Once in a while he would go to a rich person's house, but it was only to redeem them, <laughs> to get them back right. And Jesus spent most of his time with the outcasts, the downtrodden, the people society shunned, the people who would not be accepted by the general public, fishermen, shepherds, tax collectors, publicans. Jesus spent time with them because as Jesus said himself, those who are redeemed don't need a savior. Those who are already right don't need a savior. And what that does to us is it calls on us not to simply spend our time with the folks who already get it, but to spend our time and our energy in redeeming the others, or at least in telling them they've been redeemed. That it ain't over till it's over. It's not over till it's over. And 
That's the good news if I ever heard it. Doesn't mean God's given up on us, God's quit on us, and we ought not to quit on ourselves. We should never quit on ourselves. May that be so for each of us. Let us pray. Father, forgive us when we think that our life is beyond redemption. Or that some error that we've made is beyond your redeeming. Remind us that you are a faithful God. You've proven that in Jesus Christ. And that you're always working for us. You're always moving for our benefit. Help us, God. Accept that. And remind us that we have responsibility for others, for those who need a good word from you. Because you've given us that good word, teach us to share it. For those, God, who are still suffering from this virus, we pray for their healing. For those who've undergone surgery this week, we pray for their healing. For those who are facing hard times and trying to figure out how to best help those that they love. We pray for them and their good judgment, their compassionate love. God, for those who struggle with life and don't know that you've already worked it out, help us to remind them that you have not given up on we thank you for the opportunities to share your good word. We thank you for the opportunities to be your people in the world. We thank you for the opportunity to make a difference. Now, oh God, we pray for our world. We pray that war will cease and that peace will indeed come. A peace that passes all understanding. Forgive us when we don't believe that that's possible. Help us to look forward to it. Of course, in the name of Christ, we ask it. Praying again the words that you've taught us that we should pray, the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and use the words of the creed to confess what we believe. It's a nice thing to read. Christian, what is it we believe? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God of God, light of light, true God for true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified on Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose in accordance with the Scripture. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin, and we look for the resurrection of the